welcome you to this another wonderful day of uh, the Global Prayer Focus. Uh, today is a very, very special day in the United States of America, uh, where you have the National Day of Prayer for America. And accordingly, this uh, event started back in 1983. In 1983, the first uh, known call for this kind of a meeting was held. And since then, it has been going on, going on and going on. And we thank God for it because nations of the world need God. Uh, the Bible tells us plainly that righteousness exalts a nation and sin is a reproach to any people. And so we thank God. We welcome you today and pray that you'll invite someone to share with us today as we're going to continue to talk about best practices for protecting our children. I believe with all of my heart that the protection of children, the care for children, uh, what we do with our children will determine what happens to the home, what happens to the family, what happens to the community, what happens to the nation. It's all about what we do with our children. Children, as we have said, are a heritage of God. And so we thank God for them and for what they do. We're going to pray, and uh, we will have a music uh, announcement if we do, and then we'll come back to talk about best practices to protecting our children. Let us pray. Gracious God, our Father in heaven, today we come to you to begin to look at your word. Father, we thank you that uh, your word is from the foundation of the world. And you said that your word will never, ever come back void. And we have seen it. And Lord, we thank you today, even as it's set aside as a national day of prayer to pray for the United States of America and certainly around the world. We ask, oh God, that prayers that have been lifted up from all over the place will please come before your presence. And not only must it come before your presence, God, but it may it please you. May those requests please you to answer and bless your world and bless your people. And especially as we continue, God, to look at how we can recover, redeem, reclaim our homes, our children for God. Bless these times of sharing. Bless each and every one that is making their way and those who will make their way by way of uh, visualizing on YouTube and other means. Bless us now and cause us each to be a blessing. In the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. And thanks be to God. Yesterday, we shared with you that when it comes to protecting our children, one of the best practices is, in fact, through volunteerism volunteerism, where we get involved, not waiting for a paycheck, not waiting for someone to invite us, but getting involved in the life of our children, in the life of vulnerable children and their families. I shared with you uh, about this lady in Florida who is a retired teacher. And she realized that she'd retired and has uh, some life still in her and had opportunities still with her. And what did she do? She went out and arranged for one of these uh, uh, community places uh, at some of these uh, uh, housing estates and uh, focused on children coming back from school. Children go into school, children during the holiday that will have nothing to do. She spent her time continuously to invest in them. She could have stayed home and 
uh, on her porch and talk about what bad children these children are and what they're not doing and what they could be doing, what they should be doing. Instead, what she did was she volunteered her time and went and made herself available, teaching them how to read, teaching them how to write, teaching them how to do the mathematics so that when they go back to school, they will not be ashamed. They will not be the scorn and the laughing stock of the class. I believe that if you can see, you have a responsibility to help those who cannot see. If you can walk, you have a responsibility to help those who cannot walk. I believe that life is about giving, sharing, helping to make a difference in this world. I shared with you how in 17 and 51, Sunday school got started. The Protestant Sunday school got started because of a gentleman by the name of William King, who saw children out in the streets when they should have been in church or children who should have been in school with nothing happening for them. Here again, Mr. William King could have easily chosen to sit around and talk about children and what they're doing, what they're not doing, what worthless parents they come from, et cetera, et cetera. No, what Mr. King did was to start teaching these children, making a difference. Imagine if all of us, each of us, if it's just one child, one family, one person, you invested in to make a difference in that person's life. What a difference it would be. And so I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you today that uh, when we talk about children and the challenges that they're facing, because I tell you, children are now growing up in some very, very difficult times. Just yesterday, I believe, the United Methodist Church voted to lift a ban that was put into place in 1984, banning the uh, business of homosexuality and banning same-sex marriages, banning preachers from uh, doing such. But that ban is lifted. So now, in the United Methodist Church in America, after they've carried that to all of the conferences and they have voted upon it, it will be that in the United Methodist Church, there's no restriction. You can have same-sex marriage. Preachers can no longer say, I will not marry you because, you know, of my belief. These are the times our children are growing up in in the political spheres, when someone who has over 90 plus indictments and still leading in the polls, white supremacy, injustices in the judicial systems. It should not have started with, but now it is about to go into action where marijuana is going to be somewhat less of a crime. Our children are growing up in some interesting times. And say what you want to say. There are foundations that make up a society. Foundation that make up a church. Foundation that make up an individual. I was telling the supervisor you know, Jesus said he's coming back for a church without spot or without wrinkle. It's going to be interesting. It's going to be interesting. But what can we do? What can we do to help the next generation? We can volunteer time to make a difference in a child's life. It is said that the worst time for children in 
America. I'm not sure about other parts of the world, but the worst time for children in America is between the hours of three o'clock to about seven o'clock in the evening. You know why? Because it is during that period of time that school is out. And sometimes, oftentimes, parents are not home. Most people in the community are gone to work. And these children are there raising themselves. They're there engaging in all kinds of interesting activities. And the thing about life, and it is just a little that I've come to know, that people are hard to forget and to forgive. Oh, God can forgive you in a heartbeat. But people, they will always remind you. You remember they used to say to Jesus, who is he? Is he not uh, Mary's child, that carpenter's son? They always reminded Jesus, you're just like one of us. Who are you to come and tell us you're the son of God? We'll make sure you never say it again. People are hard to forgive and hard to forget. So we need to do as much as we can so that children do not grow up with all kinds of interesting, as they call it on the street, rap. Rap has to do with the multiplication and the accumulation of character defects. Every time you end up in the courthouse, every time you end up in the prison, every time you end up wherever, it is on your record. And that's why sometimes when children go to uh, grow up and they become young adults and they become adults and they go find a job, and all they have to do is put in their social security number, and the rest is history. They say, go come back. We'll call you later on. Volunteer your time. Make use of your time. The 168 hours that God has given us every week, do something to make a difference in somebody's life so that at the end of the day, you too can declare if I can help somebody, then my living will not be in vain. You know, we love to preach that text uh, from 2 Timothy 4, where the Apostle Paul said, you know, I fought a good fight. And uh, we love to preach from that passage when someone passes away. And then you go find out what did they do to fight a good fight? How many folk did they lead to Christ? How many persons do they have as disciples of Jesus Christ? What did they do? And the truth be told, all they did was to come to church every Sunday. They came to Bible study. They came to Sunday school. They came to church. They came to, they came to church. But did they go to make disciples for Jesus Christ? Did they go to give somebody water to drink in the name of Jesus? Did they go to the prison to visit somebody? Did they go give somebody some clothes to wear? Did they go to make a difference in somebody's life? You remember what Jesus said on the day of judgment? There will be two sets of people. One set to the right, another set to the left. And the question would be, what did you do? Jesus said, he would say to those on the right, I was hungry, you fed me. I was sick, you visited me. I was naked, you clothed me. Yes, I was in prison, you came and you visited with me. I was a stranger, you took me in. And the righteous would say, Lord, when do we see you? And Jesus said, when you did it to the least of these, you did it unto me. My sisters and my brothers, volunteer your time. I believe on the day of judgment, it will be very much worth your time that you did spend your time to make a difference in somebody's life. I shared with you once upon a time the story about this big time preacher. You know who a big time preacher is? A big time preacher is the type of preacher who shows up with five or six uh, armor bearers guiding him or her. A big time preacher is the type that uh, when you call their office, 
You got to call six, seven, eight people before you get to the preacher. A big time preacher is the one that when he when he's preaching or she's preaching, uh, they have people standing in the front making sure that no one gets to them. Big time preacher. This guy was a big time preacher. And you know, big time preachers, small time preachers, mid-side preachers, all of us have a tendency to die. He went to heaven accordingly. When he got there, he met St. Peter. And uh, St. Peter said, what's your name? <laughs> you know, when you think you're a big shot, you know, you don't care to give him, I'm Mr. X, Y, Z. Peter looked in the book of names. Peter said, sir, I, I'm sorry to tell you, but your name is not in here. My name is not in there. You need to look again. And he got annoyed because he was a big time preacher, had a huge congregation, was a developer of the community. I mean, he did some awesome things. And his name was not in the land book of life. That was not a happy camp of that day. And he was told to go to the opposite of heaven. And you know the opposite of heaven, right? So he's on his way to the opposite of heaven and he encounters an angel. And the angel said, go back and tell Peter, not that you are a big time preacher, but go back and tell Peter that you used to feed birds. You love feeding birds. That was your passion. When you left church, when you left all the big, big meetings and you came home, you would feed the birds. All of the birds came at the back of your house and you fed them. You spent money buying food for birds. Go tell him you are a bird feeder. And uh, it was almost like in the case of uh, that general who was big time general, but had leprosy. And he went back and said, uh, Peter, uh, will you look in the uh, section that talk about bird feeders and see if my name is up in there? <laughs> so Peter turned over, got to bird feeder. And guess whose name was on the top of the list? Not for preaching. Not for building communities, not for doing all of the major things, not for being on the cover of the magazine, not for being the kind of preacher that could pick up the phone and call the president, call the senator, call the mayor. No, those were not the reason why his name was in the Lamb Book of Life. He was there because what? He fed birds. And the moment he got there, they saw his name as a bird feeder. Look here, look here. Peter gave the signal and they started to celebrate. One more soul has made it into the kingdom. Not because of what was considered flamboyant, not what was considered to be affluent that made him to get into heaven's gift. It was because he took care of the least of these. He was a bird feeder. I want to encourage you. What are you doing with your time? What are you doing to make a difference? You say, well, you know, I'm tired. I'm retired. I'm at home. Nothing. Uh, listen, you can do something even from home. <laughs> that telephone that you have, you can call people, check on them, pray for them. Pray with them. Clara Barton that formed the uh, American Red Cross. Half of the time she was sick from her sick bed. She worked on the establishment of the American Red Cross. And if you are healthy, strong, can run, leap up, over walls, you can do something. You know, the summer is coming up very soon here. And children will be all over the place. And oftentimes, it is poor children with no meaningful summer activities that will go back to school and all that they learned 
would have been erased. And they go back and they have to start all over again. This summer, if it's just one child, if it is just one family, strive to make a difference. And truly, your living will not be in vain. So the first step to help protect children from harm, from danger, is through volunteerism. Giving up your time to make a difference for a family. You know, some organizations have a, a day for mothers to go and do something for themselves. And so they provide an opportunity for the children to come and they will watch them, teach them, train them. You know, one thing we need to start doing, we must stop in our organizations babysitting. That is just to, you know, you watching television and giving them some food to eat and keep it moving. No, we need to become intentional in teaching them something meaningful, something of worth, something that will cause them to want to transform their lives. You know, the story is told about uh, Thurgood Marshall in America, there was a judge. He was the first African-American to sit on the Supreme Court uh, uh, bench. His name was Thurgood Marshall. Do you know how Thurgood Marshall became so proficient in the Constitution? It is said that Thurgood Marshall had a serious temper problem. Bottom line, he had a behavior problem. And every time he went to school, he got into some kind of trouble. And I don't know whether or not it was intentional, but the principal will give him the Constitution and tell him, go down to the basement and, and read that. That was his punishment, to go read the United States Constitution. And Thurgood Marshall will go and read and read and read. And so he got into trouble so many times and so many times he had to go read the Constitution until he became very, very proficient. And so when he graduated from, from school, he knew the Constitution in and out. And as he went to law school, that's a whole different question, and practice eventually becoming a, 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 a Supreme Court justice. Why? Because what was considered punishment was for him an opportunity to climb the ladder of success. What am I saying to you? When we have an opportunity to work with children, let's do something with them that will become of such that in the future, it can be a benefit. And if we would do that, we can protect our children from the horror of the evil that is surrounding our children. Any question on that or any comment before we move on? All right. The next way by which we can protect our children is to discipline our children. Remember now, discipline and punishment are not one and the same. We must learn that. We must discipline our children. In other words, as the scripture says in uh, Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 6, that says, train up the child in the way that he or she should go, that when he or she is old, they will not depart from it. So when we talk about the discipline of children, teaching children the way they should go, there are several ways for children to go. Number one, the way of God. What is God's plan for the child? It is for us as parents to be able to be so observant that we've come to get an understanding of what the way of God is for that child and help that child to progress in that direction. That's number one. Number two, 
what is considered the proper way in society for a child to go, to be respectful, to be ethical, know how to uh, not take things that do not belong to them. Bottom line, what is it that is involved in the Ten Commandments? What is it that is involved in the Golden Rule? What is the way that we consider as ideal in society? Are we teaching our children? Are we disciplining our children as to what are the right things to do? You see, it's only when you discipline that you have a right to punish. You know, that's why the, the, the prison system is somewhat failing in America because the prison system is there to correct, but you cannot correct that which is not even there. And that's why the home and the system must work together. Punishment and discipline must go hand in hand. You cannot discipline, you cannot punish rather, if you have not first disciplined the person. Now, when it comes to the matter of disciplining or punishing our children, we must never ever discipline a child when you are upset. Not a good time, not a good time. You know, some parents, they will allow the uh, infractions to mount up mount up, mount up until it gets to a boiling point and they will say enough is enough and they wear into you like nobody's business. The child will remember the whipping, but oftentimes they will remember what wrong they did. But in terms of the reinforcement of what was taught may not be there. Oh yes, many of us on this platform now can, can remember time when we did that which was inappropriate, that which was wrong, our parents didn't think it was right, and they didn't hesitate to allow the belt, the switch, whatever, to have an encounter with our skin. In other words, you got a whipping. Sometimes you got a whipping and sometimes you got a beating. You know, there's a difference between getting the whipping and getting the beating and getting the punishment. You know, punishment is like, you know, go to your room and uh, time out. That's punishment. Then you have the, 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 the point where you get a switch, just a little tiny something, you know. And then when you really get the beating, that's when anything that is available is coming at you. But the problem is when you want to discipline, do not discipline when you are angry. I'll tell you an instance in the Bible that you know typifies what we are talking about. Jesus, you know, told his disciples, uh, I want you all to stay in Jerusalem until you have received the Holy Spirit and then you can go out and heal people, teach people and baptize and do all of these wonderful things that I've done. All right. Jesus is absent. And what happens? Peter says, I'm going to fish. That's in John chapter 21. Peter said, I'm going fish. And guess what? All the other disciples said, oh, wow, Peter. Man, Peter is leader in the gang. You know, we we're in Caesarea Philippi. And Jesus asked the question, who do men say that I am? It was Peter who said, thou art the Christ, son of the living God. It was Peter. 
Do you recall when we uh, were in the boat and the storm came on the waters and uh, Jesus was coming, walking on the seas? It was Peter who said, Lord, if you are the Christ, bid me come to you. It was Peter who walked on waters. Peter. And so if Peter says he's going to fish, it must be all right. Let us all go. And they went all night, all night, mosquito biting them, all night, they caught nothing, absolutely nothing. That's a whole different story. You see, all of us have an assignment in this world called life. And sometimes the difficulties we experience in life is a result of us not operating in our purpose, nor in our assignment. All night they caught nothing. Early that morning, Jesus, they see him on the shows and Jesus called out, hey guys, did you all catch anything? I said, no, mm -mm. all night, nothing. And they didn't recognize who he was. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat. Throw your net on the right side of the boat. Really? You know, we are professional fishermen and we know that we do better in the night. And this man coming here talking about throw your net on the right side in the morning. But we'll do it. That's what he said. And they threw their net. And accordingly, they caught so many, up to 153, so much so that they had to call people to come and assist them to draw in the net. When they got through, when they came on the show, later on, John said, Peter, that was Jesus. He ran up to Jesus. When they all got there, Jesus had brought some fish and bread. And Jesus said, come have breakfast, fish and bread breakfast. And they ate. Afterwards, Jesus took Peter by, by, by on the side and said, let me ask you a question, son. Do you love me? On three occasions, Jesus asked him, do you love me? One time he said, feed my sheep, care for my lamb, etc., etc." But Jesus did not reprimand Peter out of anger. It was in a loving manner that he said to Peter, this is how I want you to do it. And so I said to you, when it comes to the business of the reprimand of our children, when it comes to the business of, uh, in fact, discipline our children or punishing our children, do not do it when you are angry. As a matter of fact, in the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter four and verse 15, it says what? We must speak the truth but we must speak the truth in love. We must speak the truth in love. Yes, whatever we do, we must do it to glorify God. And the same it is when it comes to discipline our children, punishing our children, it must be done in love. And if we will volunteer, and if we will discipline our children, and discipline them in love, there is a high probability we will protect them from the ravishing evil of this world of ours. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen and amen.